Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform, and the details for that are below in the description. We want to be praying for you, and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au, and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, salvation and glory and power belong to you. We gather here week after week, month after month, year after year. We come to worship the one true God. We have come to have our hearts cleansed. We come to hear the word preached, to grow in wisdom and knowledge. We come to fellowship. We come to present ourselves before the throne of the great and holy God. You, Lord, who called out one man to be a blessing to all mankind, Abraham. A God who brought slaves out of a superpower and made them a nation, Israel. A God who sets rulers in place, David. A God who himself lived among mankind, who walked and talked and was known. He who died to buy mankind back from the slavery of sin, Jesus, fully man, yet fully God. Lord, we belong to you, but not just because you have made us, but because you knew our sinful condition and redeemed us with your own blood and suffering. We are not of the physical bloodline of Abraham or share the history of slaves who passed through the sea. We have not seen the ancient splendour of a godly king such as David. We have not walked the roads with Jesus or sat and listened as he taught. Removed by time and distance we may be, yet Orange Baptist Church shares the same spiritual history of slaves who uh, share the same spiritual history of slaves who passed through the sea. Sorry. In Orange Baptist Church shares the same spiritual history, shares the same spiritual bloodline and worships the same almighty God as those who have gone before us. We look forward to the same future and the same reward. An eternity outside of the constraints of time. An eternity without suffering, without tears and without pain. But best of all, eternity with our triune God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One holy God, indivisible and so holy and just. Glory to you, Lord God. Father, an essential of living a life of faith is to be honest with you, humbly admitting our sin, and with your help, walking in repentance, walking with you away from sin and not looking back. You are our God and we are your children. Point out to us anything that does not sit right with you and help us to agree with you and walk in step with you. Father, we lift before you all in our congregation who are in need of healing, a healing touch, whether physically, mentally or emotionally, and for those who grieve the loss of loved ones. In your mercy, grant healing and the closeness of your Holy Spirit. We ask your blessing in our lives, our homes, our workplaces and schools and anywhere we find ourselves. We trust in your abiding presence. 
You call on us to partner with you to set the oppressed free, to share our food with the hungry, to provide shelter for the wanderer, to clothe the naked and not turn away from our own flesh and blood, to refrain from malicious talk and the pointing finger. With this in mind, we lift before you all those who have left comfortable lives to pursue the call of Christ and walk alongside those in need. In particular, we ask you to bless those men and women and children who we help support through the missionary committee as they seek to be a blessing to those around them. Help us here at OBC to also live this way, blessing others outside these walls with the good news of Jesus, with practical help and with genuine friendship. Almighty God, Father, we end this prayer with the words of Jesus recorded in the book of Revelation. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Please come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 17. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing at the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, who was honoured by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Thudias appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. 
They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Father, as we dive into your word this morning, I ask that by your spirit that you might speak to us, that you might strengthen us and equip us with all that we need to continue to live in your name in the world around us. Lord, we ask that your grace might fall upon us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We, uh, we continue in this section in Acts chapter 5. Um, and, and this really is, uh, is a part of a bigger section, which is an obvious statement. But, but bear with me in this. Uh, that what we have seen from Acts chapter 4, I'm going to take you all the way back into Acts chapter 4, and what we saw was the first levels of opposition towards the gospel. Yep. Uh, we, we saw they had taken Peter, they had taken John, uh, the chief priests and the Sadducees, they had taken them and they had warned them and then they had sent them out along their way. Uh, that we have this kind of beginnings of the church in an uncomfortable position as it's trying to kick off. That it feels precarious. To add it to that, we then jump into Acts chapter 5 and we have the whole Ananias and Sapphira issue. And again, the church feels precarious. What's going to happen to this movement of Jesus' followers? Straight after that, we have this incredible moment where there's these signs and wonders and answers to prayer. And finally, it starts to feel like the tide might be shifting. And as quickly as that feeling comes, it goes. Because now what we have is not just this ongoing sense of precariousness of the church, but it is an increasing fear on what is going to happen. There's an intensification that is taking place in terms of the opposition towards not only the gospel itself, but now the church. It feels like that there's pressure both inside and this huge pressure on the outside. And what we are supposed to, to, to contemplate at least is, how on earth is this going to play itself out? Or to put it another way, how on earth is Jesus going to rescue this one? That's really at the heart of this. And, and we can see that particularly in uh, Gamaliel or in my kind of reading every time I read it, I can't get out of Gargamel in my head. Um, maybe that's just because I'm a child. Um, but regardless, there's this sense in which even as he speaks this out, there's this kind of human truth to this where it's this question on like, well, it's looking pretty dicey. Only God can save it from here. And that's the challenge. This is a long section of Scripture. I'm going to try and do as best I can in a limited amount of time to unpack it. But just by way of some teaching stuff, it's really, I think, as I've looked at this passage, I think it's broken down into two main sections. Right? And so you can write this if you're a note taker, take some notes, go back and read it and see what you think. But... It seems to me that the first section really is verse 17 through to 26. And, and, and this is kind of like out of the frying pan and into the fire. And then you've got kind of 27 through to 42 as these kind of two distinct units. And it's on that premise that I'm going to try to unpack it as best I can. You with me? Isn't it interesting that in the context preceding this section of Scripture, we have this constant process of miracles and healings, where what we've seen is God's favour and His 
presence and his manifest power, not as a mean to authenticate the disciples, but authenticate the word and uh, that they are speaking, the gospel message that they are speaking. That this gospel message of a risen Jesus is shown all the more clearly through these signs and wonders. And what we've had is, is that while it has been a larger element, it has largely been around broken, injured, um, demon-possessed people. But look how God's miraculous power is at play as a precursor to the proclamation of the gospel again, both in the temple courts and before the leaders. You with me? Just keep that in your mind as we go. So let's jump in. Kicks off like this in verse 17. So then the high priest and all the associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Why were they filled with jealousy? Because again, these apostles were coming into, and it wasn't just Peter and John, it was all of them now. They're coming in and there's healings and there's proclamations of the gospel. And what we've seen is mountains of people, men, women and children added to their number daily, right? So their influence continues to grow. And so then the high priest, that's the one who certainly had his fingers all over the execution of Jesus, and his associates and were members of the party, the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. Now this is important, what's going on in their heart? They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. And this is our first little hint that for the first time, this is not going to be backroom politics. What is about to take place is going to be in front of everyone. Everyone's going to see it, warts and all. There's no hiddenness. There's just going to be big sheds of light and what on earth is going to take place. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell all the people about this new life. It's two things. Feels like Acts chapter 4 on repeat, but now really intense. So the Sadducees and the chief priests, they're now full of rage and jealousy. And in that moment, the only way to constrain this is to kind of quash any sense of an uprising, which is to put them in a public jail so that everyone knows what's taking place. Everyone in in, in the temple knows that these men have now been arrested and will be put on trial publicly. Yep. And then God turns up. And how does He turn up? By somehow opening the doors that cannot be opened and, uh, and picking the locks that cannot be picked and blinding the eyes of the guards who can't be blinded for them to walk out. Now, if you've got questions about this passage, take a number. And if you want me to unpack it for you, I can't. Because the passage doesn't give us any more information apart from God did a thing. And a really, really big thing, one that's kind of cool. That's as good as I've got. It's interesting though that later on we're going to have a second account of kind of God and his jailbreak antics and we're going to give a lot more we're going to be given a lot more information. But at this point it kind of feels eerily similar to this story about a guy who was in a tomb when there's this whole legion of guards out the front and uh, he kind of walks out and they're still there and they don't know what on earth's gone on. Whatever's happened, the same work that rose Christ from the dead is now at work in releasing these disciples. Now notice that in releasing the disciples, what they're not told to do is to quietly pack up your homes and move out into the bush because they're coming for you. Rather, the angel of the Lord 
who is not Jesus Himself. And the reason why I can deduce that it's not Jesus Himself is because every time Jesus actually shows up in the book of Acts, Luke tells us that Jesus actually turned up at a moment. This isn't the case. This is an angel of the Lord, which happens time and time and time again throughout the Scriptures, including in the book of Exodus, when the angel of the Lord passes over the homes and delivers the people. Now, I, I, I'm not going to go as far as some commentators to say that this is a, an Exodus-esque kind of divine kind of display and, and, and the likes in terms of releasing the captives although that would be an easy thing to say. What I would say is that again, the power of the Lord, as it was in delivering Egypt, is now delivering His people again under different circumstances. And when He turns up, He tells them to get out of the frying pan and back into the fire. In other words, so you know how you boys got arrested and like there's a fair chance, like they've already warned you that they're going to break your legs. You've gone back again. I keep showing myself and now they're really angry at you. Um, I want you to keep going back. To that point, I, if I was a disciple, my, my humble answer would be no. But then I... I'm not sure exactly what I would say if all of a sudden I was either picked up and plucked out of jail or that somehow everyone became unconscious and I just needed to make sure the door was locked on my way out. I don't know what went on. But maybe at that point, when God says, go back into the temple courts, you kind of go, all right. And that's exactly what they do. And then what takes place? Well, at daybreak, they did as they were told. And when the high priest and the associates arrived at the temple to get on with persecuting and to get on with this whole arresting and kind of dealing with the courthouse drama, no one has dared kind of at this point go, "Um, no one's in the prison I just like how they're kind of like, let them have their morning coffee before we bring this up. Let's get them settled at their desk before we mention the fact that they're really bad at trying to hold people hostage. So they turn up and they call together the whole Sanhedrin. And I love this. The full assembly of the elders of Israel. Right? So it's like resuming parliament. Everyone is there. You can't hide your mistakes at this point. Yeah? God has just orchestrated that He might show up where no one can deny because all the people of power are there waiting. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. That is the apostles. They weren't there. So they went back and reported. Now, I would have loved to have seen that report. Um, can I have a minute? We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the door, to which I'm sure they're nodding in approval. Hmm, good. This is the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, uh, except when we opened the door, no one was there. To which it's like, what do you mean no one was there? Well, what I mean is no one was there. No, no, what do you mean by that? So what I mean was is like the space is there, but the people inside, they're not. That's what I mean by that. I just just think there's got to be some toing and froing. I'm sure they didn't go, is that right? Well, that's disappointing. Let's get on to finding out what's going on here. And so when they opened the door, there was no one inside. And this, and and I've put the emphasis as mine here, but but take a look at this. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest were at a loss. Well, that's probably a fair statement, right? 
But actually, what is the motivating factor? And they were wondering what this might lead to. Now, that is pretty much as it is in the Greek. Because I was like, surely they meant, what happened to them? Or, or, Or where are they now? But their concern wasn't actually for the immediate. Their concern was for them. Because they're like, this is getting really out of hand now. What on earth is this going to mean for us? Because these guys have been doing this in public the whole time. We're the ones who have grabbed them and put him in jail. We're the one that's gathered everyone together except the ones who are actually going to be on trial. And rather than asking the question, how has this occurred? What they're wondering is, is like, I think this is going to go badly for us. What are we going to do about that? And then someone came and said, hey, uh, they're actually back where we arrested them before and they're teaching the people. And at that, the captain went with his officers, so the same people, and they bought the apostles, but they didn't use force. It was a gentle conversation of like, please, sir, may you come with me? Ever so quietly. And why? Because they were terrified. But who were they afraid of? Was it God who would clearly manifest His presence? Was was there fear in, have we got this wrong? No, no, no. They doubled down. They doubled down and they're like, we are terrified of the people. So um, if we do this publicly, we're going to get stoned for it. By which I'm not talking about getting a prescription for cannaboid. Like they're talking about getting really big rocks and having them pegged at their head until they die. And that kind of death that leads to death is really uncomfortable, so I'm told. But not by the people who were stoned to death because they're dead. But everyone else around them must have noticed that it was very uncomfortable. This is terrifying. And then again... We, what we have is, is this response. They have this response of the people. So we have this arrest. We have this intensification of pressure. And now we've got them before the courts again and everyone's quiet. And I made a mistake with my PowerPoint, so I'm going to quickly skip over this one. And they pull these disciples in. And what's their response to this? We gave you really strict orders on what you could and couldn't say. I warned you I would give you detention and you did not obey me. You very naughty little children. And he says, you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. This teaching of the gospel had been physically seen constantly in the temple courts and spoken of in the temple courts. Everyone comes to temple. You come to temple daily for prayer. And in the middle of Solomon's colonnade, and again, we've seen this name come up time and time again, they are in the middle of it where everyone is on full display, not hiding, not being secretive, not being undermining, not being manipulative. They just, here it is. We are just Jesus followers. When someone asked, are you a follower of Jesus? They're like, yeah. Look, I've got no one else to offer you apart from Jesus. Like they weren't hiding anything, right? And then they say, you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now, a part of that is true. Part of that is true from a human level. Absolutely. Like the chief priest was the one who manipulated the whole kangaroo court. He and his offsiders. 
But on another sense, they're feeling their own guilt, but that's not necessarily the full intent of what the gospel message says. And, and again, the apostles speak this out. Peter and the other apostles replied, um, we, we've got to obey God more than human beings. We've got to obey God. God is our authority. And not you, not your interpretations, not your perspectives, not your deducings. God is our authority. He is our sovereign Lord. And what He says goes. Sometimes that's really uncomfortable. Like when an angel of the Lord turns up, locks you, gets you out of jail and then goes, go back and do it again. That's really uncomfortable. But again, they continue to do this out of what? Obedience. Obedience. But the kind of obedience that isn't just doing it because I have to, but an obedience that responds to Christ because they love Him. At great cost to themselves, I'm sure when they don't feel like it, and certainly when they want to run away, they stand up in the middle and they continue to proclaim the message of the Gospel over and over and over again. Because that's what God has asked them to do. And then they say, the God of our ancestors. In other words, Yahweh, the covenantal, faithful, loving Lord of all creation. This same God raised Jesus from the dead, whom you did kill by hanging on a cross. That's just facts. You stitched him up. They hung him on a cross. And God, and then in verse 31, and God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and saviour, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And this is the other side. In other words, yeah, you perform some stupid stuff in your humanity. But this was always a part of God's plan. God is the one who has orchestrated all of these things. He just, he just used your hands. He just let sin manifest itself in you so He could bring about His purposes. He didn't cause them to sin. He just allowed the manifestation of their hearts and He uses it in His sovereignty as He so desires. Are you with me? So in the one sense, they're like, you're making us guilty of His blood. Yep, yeah, no, no, yep, you are, you are. But good news, God's plan was even bigger than this. God's plan was even bigger than this. And it was for the redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Your sin, your sin by hanging Him and rejecting Him, there is this moment as He speaks it, He's not just throwing a baseball bat at their head. He's just giving facts as a means by which that they too might come to repentance, which is why He's saying, that the Saviour might bring Israel to repentance. These are all of, not some of, this is all of the authorities of Israel. Like everyone's in the room. This is a moment in which there is an invitation of repentance, that they might turn away and that they might see Jesus as the Messiah and come to Him too. But they, they don't. Sorry to spoil it, um, spoilers. We are witnesses of these and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given those who obey. Persecution is starting to ramp up here in the early church and it's precarious. And even in this, in, in this moment of uncertainty and, and anxiety and and fear, the apostles still say, we have to obey God rather than human beings. That there is still this unwillingness to go with the prevailing culture and, and, and to feel the weight and the pressure coming down upon them and bow to it. They, they just refuse to. 
that there's refusal to do this because of the gospel that they have seen and have received who continue to walk in step of knowing what Jesus has actually done. It is this gospel that is embedded within them through the Spirit that enables them to graciously, by the way, stand under the pressure and not throw their toys out of the cot, but to faithfully proclaim. And there is a lesson here for us. I truly believe this. I think... I think Acts, and I've said it all along, it's got so much to say to us and so much to teach us as the church that we've gone away from for so long. Because again, and I've said this before, because we've enjoyed for centuries positions of power and positions of comfort in our Western society. And that is being diminished, right? Like, like it is. And there is a sense In which, and again, please hear what I'm saying. The West, we are not persecuted. And if we say that we are, we do a disservice to our brothers and sisters throughout the world who are persecuted. But I think it is also fair to say that we are starting to feel uh, the the warmth, if you will, the uncomfortable warmth of, of this hostility, not persecution, but a hostility to the gospel. And in that that we are seeing the church, that the church globally fractured around whether we are going to stand under the authority of Christ or whether we're going to bow to the prevailing culture. And not just on sexuality, on a whole range of things. And so the question then comes for me that seems obvious at least is again, Who are we going to obey? God or human beings? This hostility towards the gospel is unlike anything we have experienced or even our grandparents, our great-grandparents, and I don't really mind how old you are, we've experienced fairly comfortable kind of scenarios. But now from academics through to social media and everything in between, the hostility continues to grow towards the gospel and his church. And so the question is, how do we live in this tension? Because if we were to take this what we were going to do is go and build ourselves a great big timber box and we're going to go down to kind of post office lane and we're just going to scream at people, turn or burn. But that's not really what's going on here. They just kept going to temple and God kept using them and they kept speaking. They weren't being antagonistic. They weren't arguing for arguing's sake. They weren't fighting for their rights or their privileges. They were just faithful. They were just faithful. But in their faithfulness, they weren't hidden away. Did you you notice that? They didn't kind of go, you know what, we're going to sit comfortably with a quiet faith. But what we mean is, is I believe in Jesus in my heart and so just don't ask me about him. No, 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 that's not what was happening. They weren't being a pack of jerks, but at the same time, they weren't hiding away as a pack of cowards. Did you see that? I've been kind of contemplating, how do we, how do we live on going in this tension? How do we as a church continue to respond in this space? Well, Tim Keller uh, Vale Tim Keller, who passed away yesterday, uh, for those of you who do not know. Uh, Tim Keller was an amazing uh, minister, writer, scholar, um, uh, one who has had profound impact in my own walk with the Lord, uh, passed away at the age of 73 yesterday. And so fittingly, I think in this regard, 
Tim Keller, one of the beautiful things about Tim Keller is he's never been, uh, unlike other sections of the Christian church, a self-appointed prophet who spends most of his time tearing down the church. Actually, what Tim was, was this incredibly gracious man who sought to engage with culture in a very gentle manner, uh, in a way that was always truth to the gospel and never took a backward step on that. And in one of his, uh, one of the podcasts that I've been listening to for a long time, uh, someone had asked him the question, how do we live in this tension point uh, where there is increasing hostility towards the gospel and to the church? And, and, and Tim said, I think, there's, I think there's five ways. Five ways as we as the church can continue to faithfully proclaim Jesus, living truthfully for Him, is, the, as, is this uh, hostility continues to increase, and it will, he says this one, repent, which is never a fun thing to do, by the way. Uh, repent of the ways Christians' inconsistent lives have harmed the church's credibility. Um, and, and what he's saying is, is that's all of us. All of us. Um, you, me, um, him, everyone, um, every one of us who have claimed the name of Jesus live an inconsistent life in him. Right, and if and if, if you don't believe that you have, then you've just undermined it now. So stop it. Um, and so what he says is is repent, like repent, not just for yourself, but for all of the church in the way that we have lived inconsistently uh, to the gospel. Yep, in public ways, in real public ways. Number two, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. By which I think he means what he's saying is is is. Just get on the business of actually loving your neighbour, like, like literally your, your neighbour, like the people around you. So, so repent of these things, but, but, but seek to live out an authentic Christian life. In all of its ugliness and all of its difficulties, just continue to serve. Three, he says, let people know that you are a believer. Don't hide it. Don't hide it. Who wants to hide often as a Christian? Well, sometimes I read stuff that people put online as Christians and I go, yeah, I want to hide from being a Christian at this point because that was really daft. And that was incoherent, that argument. Just by way of a side point, just want to let you know, when we post things up online, and, and most of you are pretty good on this, and we post stuff about Christianity, no one has ever been convinced that they're wrong in an argument because someone posted something on Facebook or Instagram. Just, just, just going to let you know. It's, it's more of a way of just getting a dopamine hit. We've got to be careful in the way that we kind of engage, but at the same time, we don't shy away from the fact that we are indeed Christ followers. Make sure that you're not harsh or clumsy with your words. Be sure it's the gospel that offends and not you. So case in point, the way that we engage currently in the hotbed of, of debate in our society is actually really important. Either way, we aren't going to come off looking beautiful. But there's a way in which we can say things that doesn't mean that they look at us and go, you're a pack of jerks. What we can say is things that kind of go, yeah, I'm broken and sinful too. And that, you know, that's, I'm not good enough. And my identity found in anything other than Jesus means that actually I'm lost. And, and I'm just really grateful for the gospel because without Jesus, I have no capacity to come to the Father. I can't have my sins forgiven. And that in and of itself is confronting. When, when we say that, that there is a real judgment of our, of our outworking of, of, of ignoring God means that we get to ignore Him for eternity, it's confronting, right? Because people say, what do you mean that, that God's going to send me to hell? And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not making that judgment. What I'm saying to you is, if you don't want Jesus now, He will honour that for eternity. But that's not very nice. Yep, you're going to take that up with him. Because either he's ignoring him for the whole life because he's God and he's good. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to offend you. I don't need to do that. I'm just going to present the gospel. That's offensive enough, right? When we are told that we are not good enough for God, it's a little confronting. You with me? And then fifthly, 
Do not be afraid of rejection or even persecution. Jesus promised to be with us. Now, this is where it gets uncomfortable for us who have had positions of comfort and authority and the privilege for a long time. In other words, there is a prophetic edge to this, which is get comfortable being uncomfortable because of Jesus. The outworking of which is this, and we're going to move really quickly. So, they, so after, this, after this confrontation, what we have is, is that Gargamel, I mean Gamaliel, a teacher of law who was honoured by the people, stood up. And this is what he said in, in this kind of weird agnostic wisdom prophecy. He says, this, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. So there's a warning. Some of you, go, uh, some time ago, Theodos, remember Theodos, his good guy, appeared claiming to be somebody and there was 400 that rallied with him and then he died. And they all ran away, all of his followers, right? And then if that's not enough to convince you, do you remember Judas in verse 37, the Galilean who appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt? Remember him? Yeah, he too got killed and his disciples ran away, right? So he's basically saying, he's going, listen, we could do more harm than, than good. Just let them do their thing. And if God's in it, it will thrive. And if God's not, it will end. Except the fact that this time, um, the leader had already been killed and instead of the others running away, they keep running back to the temple. So that might've been a dead giveaway that you know Gargamel was a little bit off in that. So it was kind of like, everyone goes, hmm, great wisdom. And I'm like, hmm, he was dumb. Like, like hello? Like the, the very evidence you're presenting, this is the opposite. So maybe that's an indication that God's actually in it. That and the fact that God has already released people from prison without unlocking the doors or knocking off the guards. And the fact that these clearly foolish people, they just keep turning back up and saying the same thing in the same spot. Maybe that was the moment of a giveaway. Either way, Gargamel just ignored it. Don't take the wisdom out of this and say, ah, oh, we're going to spiritualise this and saying, if God is, you know, God will only bless those things that are of Him. Because at that point, Jehovah's Witnesses are still around. And the Mormons, they're still kicking about too. And every other religion's still kicking about. And they haven't finished off yet. And so what does that mean then? If we take, you know, Gamaliel's kind of, um, kind of wisdom, literally. So don't, 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 don't cause wisdom where it's not actually due. Look at the context and it was really daft. It was actually just a daft statement that God again uses for His favour. Now in that, I'm not real comfortable if I was a disciple because this is how this kind of ends a little bit. So His speech persuaded them and as they persuaded them, they're like, Yep, we're convinced. But do you mind if we bash them first? Like, it's kind of like, I'm totally convinced in everything you said. Hmm, wise words. But I'm frustrated, so can we just kind of bash them, kind of kick them on their way out the door? And so they flog them. And this is the response. And this is daft to me. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. That name is Jesus. Did you notice that it doesn't say that they went away happy? It wasn't happy, happy, joy, joy. But in their soul, there was real joy even when their circumstances meant otherwise. Because there is a hope that still holds us, that even when life kicks us down, and even when the pressures come rising, that we don't have to be happy to be joy-filled. Because my joy is not found in my circumstances, nor even in your opinions. 
my joy comes that in Jesus, one day I'm going to rest in Him. And while life can suck now, and while there is pressure and there is persecution and there is anxiety and there's fear, we continue to proclaim the gospel because it is still the means in which God chooses to bring others to Him for joy and forgiveness. So how are we going to live in this face of hostility? Can I hazard a guess and say, to the best of our ability, faithfully? Faithfully. And we're going to need one another to rejoice because there's days where I don't want to rejoice. And so I need you to remind me to rejoice. And there's going to be days where you don't want to rejoice and I'm going to need to remind you to rejoice because God is good and He is the Prince of Peace and He reigns on high. Let me pray. Lord, give us your grace today. May we not feel anxiety. May we not feel fear in light of what you are doing and in light of our current circumstances, but that we might just live faithfully for you. We pray this in your name. Amen.